Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by CakeWallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. CakeWallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Co., the lead developer on the Seraphis project and primary author of Zero to Monero. The two discuss his latest work on Seraphis, what it is and how it will benefit Monero, the pros and cons of ring signatures, the similarities of Seraphis to Lilatna Spark, the challenges of developing code robust enough to last 20 years and beyond, as well as why he thinks Monero is better at being digital cash than Zcash. Monero Talk starts now. All right. Co, what's going on, man? Uh, not a lot. So we're going to talk about Seraphis today. Uh, who's Seraphis. that? Who's that friend you have next to you over there? His name is Russert. Russert. Yeah. Looks. Uh, it looks like you two are very close. He likes to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very selfish cat, but he's friendly. I was, uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll talk about Seraphis. Uh, I actually went and was looking back at some old videos. I looked back at the video, I guess we did over a year ago, which was the first time I met you. And we were talking about Zero to Monero, uh, which you had helped author, or I guess you were the lead author on. Mm-hmm. Uh, anybody listening to this, I, I highly recommend you go back and watch that video. We, we, we covered a lot of ground there because uh, okay. we basically went through your, you know, the entire write-up of uh, Zero to Monero, and uh, it's pretty impressive. When do, when is the next one coming out? <laughs> Not for a while. Okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, 2023, we'll see. <laughs> and I'm realizing we, we never really talked about your Monero story because we had Sarang on as well, uh, so we, ne- we didn't really do the one-on-one. Um, so we'd love to hear a little bit about that before we get into Seraphis. What, sure. what got you into Monero in the first place? Well, nothing too, uh, exciting. It was, uh, 2017 when the, uh, it became first hit, like a lot of first hit the mainstream news, news cycle because of the large price increases. I, uh, caught my attention and. I was just looking around at stuff, trying to understand what was going on. And um, I, imme- I immediately became interested in Monero because it was the only currency that was advertising itself as fungible. Um, at, that, at the time I was, I, understood, I had an understanding of the importance of fungibility, so uh, after that point, I wanted to understand how it, how it was fungible. Like, um, it's not it's not something where you can just imagine how it could be the case that it, that a dig- digital currency can be fungible. So, um, as I was looking around, trying to understand, trying to look at the available resources explaining how it could be fungible. Um, I got, I was somewhat frustrated that I was unable to like 
So the available materials weren't adequate to really explain it to me. But then I found Kurt Alonso's um, master's thesis, which is the precursor to Zero to Monero. And so as I was reading his paper, I decided to um, to like edit it to fill in the gaps of my understanding as I was going through it. So each with each, because the, the his his thesis was laid out quite well from like early principles up to all the way up to the full protocol. So it had had all the right steps. There were just some missing details that, since I wasn't a I wasn't like a student of mathematics or cryptography or whatever, that I had to fill in the blanks, I guess. And also with the protocol too, there were a lot of details that are just really difficult to understand unless you spend a lot of hours staring at the code base, which I ended up doing to get a full understanding. So, so the the first Zero to Monero book kind of is kind of the result of my editing his thesis as I was getting, improving my understanding as like a kind of an exercise, a learning exercise. And then the second book, I just, I just wrote that one because there was more things to say, especially after a year and a half of um, development and so on. Very cool. And so were you, you said 2017, so were you already looking at crypto at that time? Were you already, you know, looking at interested in Bitcoin? You said it was the fungibility that attracted to you. Well, you know, I just, I was just curious. Of, of Bitcoin's lack of fungibility at that time or? Well, yeah, I mean, it's well known. So I just, I was just interested and then I was looking around. I was like, oh, Monero is the only fungible one. So I'll look at this one. I don't care about the other ones. Hmm. And then, yeah, I didn't, I wasn't looking at, at buying cryptos or anything like that. I was just interested from a technical perspective, how, how it would work. So you, you probably understand Monero better than most. Uh, I, there's, there's few people that understand it as well as you. At this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you, you really looked at it very closely, and then you went through the exercise of essentially trying to explain it to others, which I think... Uh, you know, probably has given you even deeper insight, I, I think we could assume, right? Just the yeah. fact that you were, you were trying to convey these complicated concepts in simple enough terms that everybody yeah. else could understand it. It's only three years later, really, that I feel like I have a really satisfying understanding of the whole thing. Um, like with each successive project that I've, I've been involved with, so Zero to Monero 1, Zero to Monero 2, then mechanics of mobile coin one, and then now Seraphis, the paper. So each of these projects has improved my understanding. So now I feel like, and now I'm in the process of actually implementing like a lot of the core elements of a protocol from like the ground up. But I feel, I feel like I could not have definitely, I could, definitely couldn't have been, could not have done this without all these, all this background of improving understanding. Yeah, we, we need a university of Monero. And uh, so, so others can possibly begin to understand it as well as you do. So they could start inventing in this area as well. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> um, so now that you, you know, now that you have looked at it for quite some time, how has your understanding evolved? Or I guess, I guess uh, uh, even better question, is Monero actually fungible? So you went in with this thought that, you know, let me check, check out Monero. It's supposed to be the only fungible one. Um, have you, what have you discovered? Do you think that yeah. is in actually? Yeah, I think it is. is. I think it's definitely fungible. Um, I mean, from a, uh like distinguishability perspective. If you look at the blockchain, if you try to distinguish one output from another output, uh, there's not much to go on to like dis distinguish them. 
you can do some since ring signatures are not perfect you can do some analysis of the transaction graph but it's not sufficient to have a practical impact on how people like interpret the outputs that people own so like in bitcoin there are stories about how fresh bitcoins that come from miners are more valuable than coins that have been around a while and have been transacted several times so but you don't see this with monero and i think that's like a i think it has to be something really like obvious for uh fungibility to be impacted but like beyond fungibility there's also privacy like you want to go beyond fung like fungibility to also being maximally private i think that's also they're, they're related but also separate hmm you want to explain it? so because you're saying because they're you know ring signatures obviously isn't isn't perfect for concealing uh your privacy at all times right. i guess is what you're getting but it's it's good enough for creating fungibility is that what right you're saying? because fungibility is is more about how people perceive what exists in the money supply so perce the perception people have about different units of the currency or different like chunks if people perceive them as equivalent then they're equivalent mm. but if you're talking talking about privacy privacy analysis this is a much more technical uh dimension i guess to the currency right if you're going to pinpoint and look at one individual transaction you you may be able to to learn some things about that individual transaction if you zero in on it is right. that right um yeah so how about um yeah and i don't mean to put to put words in your mouth you know uh certainly you know correct me if i'm not uh describing it the right way how about so a bitcoin do you think bitcoin is becoming more fungible or it's still as i don't know not i don't really pay attention because i'm not that interested okay I was, i've never never really been interested in bitcoin um, it doesn't seem like they're ever going to implement any like the, the bitcoin people invented confidential transactions but it doesn't seem like they'll, they'll ever impl implement it so i guess they're just doing some something else separate from what monero is doing yeah they it just doesn't interest me right they seem to be fine with the fact that it's you know not fungible at the core protocol level and they're trying to make up for it elsewhere i guess right i guess the second second layers or whatever so where where do you see Monero ultimately going in terms of its uh, you know technology? It's the the moving parts that that it has. You think ring signatures are here to stay for quite some time, or do you think we're going to to move away from that and replace it with something else? I mean, I don't know what else. Well, as far as I know. We're going to be with, stuck with ring signatures for a long time. It's possible that someone will come up with a scheme that works, that allows us to reference the whole output set when we're spending an output, like saying, "Hey, I'm going to spend an output that exists in the ledger, but I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to give you any hints about which one it might be." Like with ring signature, ring, ring signatures, you're giving you're giving observers some hints. You're saying this small group, this is where I'm spending from. But ideally, we'd want to say, "Hey, I'm I'm spending something from somewhere in the ledger. I'm not going to tell you anything about which one it might be." But from a like a technical standpoint, it's hard to do that, and so that's why I think ring ring, ring signatures are here to stay for a, quite a while. The only prospect that I'm aware of 
for moving away from ring signatures is Zcash's Halo 2 on Orchard or Orchard mm -hmm. protocol. But uh, apparently the details about that are are both scarce and very difficult, <laughs> challenging. Like way above my head, that's for sure. So I guess we'll see if if, if that um, that idea ever becomes publicly understandable, which it isn't right now, then maybe that'll show us the way into the future of moving away from ring signatures. But if it doesn't, then we're just going to be doing ring signatures for the foreseeable future. But on the other hand, of course, we can increase the ring size, which is what the goal of Surface yes. and Triptych yep. and so on are. That the perfect segue into into Seraphis. So since since we are you know going to be using ring signatures for quite some time, we might as well uh, you know use them in the best way possible, which is I guess to increase increase our decoy selections as 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 much as we possibly can without uh, increasing transaction size too much or verification time too much. And I guess right. that's where Seraphis comes in, correct? Right, right. So actually, I originally conceived of or I originally the original idea that became Seraphis uh, was derived from me thinking about how could we actually do this referencing of the whole ledger like what would what I had this like thought about um, derived from um, I think Buterin Reference Verkle proofs. And so I had this like epiphany. What if we do commitments to outputs when we're when we're reference when we're making proofs about them? And then these commitments are so generic that it's a lot easier to make membership proofs like ring signatures. So maybe if it's easy enough to make membership proofs, then that'll make it possible to do really cool membership proofs that instead of ring signatures, ones that reference the whole output set. So Seraphis is designed so that hopefully it's easy to move from ring signatures to that ideal um, kind of protocol. So it's like, it's an abstract protocol that allows different ways of proving that your the outputs you're spending exist in the ledger. So you can use ring signatures, but the ideal is hopefully that it allows even better proofs. Yeah. But yes. Okay. It also allows very efficient ring signatures. Like like it uses the same proving structure found in trip triptych, mm -hmm. which is much more efficient than what we have right now, CLC. Sorry. Yeah. No, that, that's great. <laughs> that that other point I wanna talk about that other point a little bit more so because yeah i was always my understanding was this is all right this is just a way to uh you know more efficiently create increase the ring size but you are also or what you're saying is the the what you've invented here is is something that could potentially move us closer towards moving away from ring signatures by using this by taking removing the proofs from the uh the ring signature system uh, yes. I, no, I'm, not, I'm completely butchering it but <laughs> it, it, it's getting us closer towards a different, a different method methodology for uh obfuscating the sender right potentially it takes us a step further. now so, so like with halo we, does this get us closer towards something like that? Or you wouldn't even be able to comment on that. I don't, I don't know anything about that stuff. All I, all I can say is that it, the, the, the statement you have to prove for a membership proof in Seraphis is a lot simpler than this, than the statement you have to prove in CLSAG. So in like, in like or ring CT, um, in ring CT, you have to prove one that the, the output you're spending exists in the ledger. You also have to prove that you own the output 
in the same proof. You also, and then beyond that, you also have to prove that the key image was produced from the output you're spending. So you have to do all three of these things in the same proof. But with Seraphis, you only have to do the proof that it exists in the ledger. So hopefully this, by, by, by taking these two out and doing, doing them separately, hopefully it's a lot easier to do this. Nice. And so you can just have some kind of generic, like I think Halo 2 is supposed to be like kind of generic. So hopefully it's these kind of the simple thing you need to prove in this generic proving system can combine. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> it's very exciting, Matt. We we should probably mention you're you're a mechanical engineer uh, yes, yeah. by trade, right? I mean, and then you by just, training, but not by trade. I've never actually done it. Uh, and then you, you went down this rabbit hole of Monero and be, uh, figured all this out somehow, and are now on the cutting edge and essentially inventing and new things here more or less um so tri triptych didn't do it this way right triptych was was different right so triptych did all three in the same proof mm -hmm. you, even though we can use the same proving structure to do seraphis membership proofs um it's the usage in seraphis is a lot simpler than in triptych where it's doing multiple things at the same time but yeah it's, Trip, or triptych had to do all three things in the same proof and that unfortunately um caused caused it caused us to need new a new way of constructing key images and this new way of constructing key images that was compatible with the proving structure that was defined in triptych meant that it became a lot more difficult to do multi-signature transactions because these key images were weren't very compatible with how multi-sig, how you want to perform multi-sig. So, but with Surface, since since these things, these uh, the key, things related to the key image are separate from the membership proof structure, you can do a, a separate proofs about them. You can have much more arbitrary definitions of the key image. And so we can have easily have a key image that works well with multi-sig and is also also has all the other properties that we want from it, like not revealing which output you're spending or whatever, stuff like that. And was that part of what you were thinking about as you were coming up with this was a way to make multi-sig work or it just happens that it works out that way? It kind of all fell into place after the initial idea I had. Um, there was some original like uh, uncertainty about how to do, like I think originally maybe I was, I just went with a triptych style of key image, but then like as I thought about it and as I discussed with the people working on Lalenta Spark, as we discussed this, how to do it better, we came up with the current approach, which is, compatible with multi-sig or friendly to multi-sig yeah help, help us understand that or uh give us a view into that a little bit too because aram and sarang were working on lalantis and then you're working on seraphis but there was i guess a collaboration because they're both very s similar right in yeah. terms of i think what they do i think what happened is aram figured out the same thing i figured out independently and like near around the same time um and then i didn't completely realize that he had come up with the same idea i had but until like a, more recently but um around that time we were discussing this how to do addressing and key images and so we kind of went back and forth with different ideas until we landed on the current idea, which is the Seraphis's um, key image structure is a little different from the Lantis Spark, but they're very similar. They use the same concepts, but it's just because we went back and forth trying to find the ideal. And so if you're, there's only one ideal, right? <laughs> so we both have the same thing now. Yeah. One yeah. Last. And I guess great great minds think alike, right? So you guys are both looking at a problem and you you came to a similar solution. 
Mm -hmm. So what are the differences ultimately then between the two? Or is it, is it negligible between the Lantis Spark and Seraphis? I'd say at a high level, they're very similar. Like, you can like distinguish them from a high level. Um, from a more practical perspective, uh, the authors of the Lantis Spark are thinking about how they can implement it in the context of Kfiro. Well, I've been thinking about how it could be implemented in the context of Monero or another ring CT base or another cryptocurrency that's using ring CT. So it's just all the details that fall under the or fall into focus when you zoom in. That's really where all the differences lie, but not from a high level. What do you think about Firo? Because, uh, you know, we had them on here and obviously because, you know, Serang used to work pretty much strictly on Monero and now he's he's helping out with Firo, which seems to be okay because we're benefiting from research that's going on there. Um, but what do you think of it as as a technology? Have you looked at it closely? I haven't looked at it, no. no. I, uh, there's only so much time in the day, I guess. Yeah, for sure, uh, for sure. Especially, I mean, you're looking at things in a very detailed way, so can't imagine you would have much time be beyond zooming into to Monero. There's also from, I also have this perspective where I like originally got interested just because I wanted to learn how it works. And then once I learned how it works, like I don't need to learn all the other ways it also works, I guess. So I, d and I didn't necessarily get involved to become an enthusiast. I just became an enthusiast as a byproduct. So my, my, my original attitude is still very similar. Like I want to understand how something works, but I don't need to know all the ways that it works. Um, so like how you can build a good cryptocurrency. I don't need to know all the ways, but I'd like to know at least one. Um, I guess that's just my perspective. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people in, in your shoes take us are, are taking a similar perspective. Those that are actually building these things. Um, what? So I guess let's zoom out for a sec. Um, I just want to make sure we cover all the. What are all the potential benefits that we're getting with Seraphis? So, we mentioned that the ring size. Or we, I guess we implied that the surface allows larger rings with similar efficiency to our current protocol. So probably on the order of 64 to 256 ring members instead of what we have now, which is 11. And also recent um, uh, research and dev meetings have, um, we've kind of come to a loose consensus that we want to go to 16 ring members for the next hard fork. Um, it's open for debate still, but, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, with Surface, we can go to much larger ring sizes without sacrificing efficiency in, either in terms of either transaction size or how long it takes to verify that a transaction is valid. Um, also, multi-sig is we can still we have the same level of friendliness to multisig with Surface as we do with our current protocol, so it's kind of neutral in that dimension. But relative to Triptych, it's it's an it's a better protocol, I guess, on that level or on that from that point of view. Um, the other main benefit is versatile addressing schemes. So. That's also a, it's also a downside to Seraphis is that uh, it cannot be implemented without abandoning the current address format. So the current, like the string of numbers that you in letters that you send to people to give you like Monero, like here's my address, give me Monero. Those have to go in the garbage to if you want to use Seraphis, and you have to get new strings. You don't need new wallets, but you need new address strings. Uh, so that's the that's the main downside to Seraphis. But the, on the upside, these address strings could be more powerful. So you can have more um, 
more fine tuned or and more powerful wallet distinctions. So distinctions between like a main wallet that has all the permissions and then a view wallet and then maybe even an, an, a, an even weaker view wallet above that. So you could have a, a view wallet that um, that identifies what outputs that you own. And then another view wallet that's more powerful that can see when you've spent outputs. But your spend key that allows you to spend those outputs is still on another, a third wallet. Um, like, but there's also a bunch of other, other variations that are possible of view only wallets with different levels of authority. And so, Right now, all you can do with the view only wallet is identify outputs you own. You can't even identify when they've been spent. So we have this weird user experience where if you want to have a separation between view and spend wallets, you always have to be exporting your key images up to the view only wallet for your view only wallet to recognize when outputs have been spent. So I think this would be a big improvement to have a view only wallet that can actually identify when, actually view when the outputs have been spent. So view the whole balance of your account. Um, but there are, there are other uh, details. Yeah, I remember possible. when I first got into Monero, the, 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 const, the view only key, and I, I, it took some time to even realize, wait, that was only with incoming transactions and not because right. you, know, you would just assume that it would mean both. So, um, Talk about that a little bit more. So what do you envision that potentially being used for? So this this way of using uh, different levels of, 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 view, of viewing into uh, transactions or wallets, does that mean the way we use wallets may change as well? The, you know, our wallets that we have on our phones may function differently as well, or there may be, a th you know, uh, well, one see that changing how how wallets function on a, a fundamental. One way that it's, it can be different is maybe not from a mass user perspective, but from a business perspective, is you can have an accounting department with a view only wallet that can see all the incoming and outgoing transactions, but that doesn't have the authority the authority to spend outputs. Um, so you you have your authority with the key whoever financial officer, and then your view only wallet with the people who are involved with looking at all the numbers. Um, from a user perspective, uh, it's, if you have like a ledger, one of those little devices uh, that has your spend keys, and then you can have your view keys on a much more, easy, a, a lot easier to use device like a phone. So you have your ledger in your phone. Your phone looks at the ledger. Or is that what's called the ledger? What are those little doohickeys called? Yeah, yeah. There's a ledger. Ledger's one of them. One of the hard. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then your phone. Your phone can see all the incoming and outgoing. And then, if you want to spend something, you talk between your phone and your ledger to spend it or whatever. Right. So, like Monerujo, are you are you following that? They're they are in trying to come up with something that's doing that right now, even without Seraphis existing, where they would have, uh, it, Monero's would be running on your, on your Android phone, but then there'd be another version called the sidekick. That's also running on a, another Android phone that you have. And that would essentially be your hardware wallet that holds right. the keys. The, and, the, the, the problem right now is now your hardware wallet always has to be exporting key images. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have to do that, that would make the UX, I think, a lot more friendly. Like you don't have to, you only have to talk between to to your hardware wallet or your secure location of your keys if you want to spend. That's the only time they need to talk. I think that from UX perspective, that's just how it should be. Interesting. So that that'd be interesting to see how that develops. And then how about like some like my Monero, are you familiar with my Monero, how they essentially use the view key yep. uh, to yeah. more quickly update a wallet so you don't have to download the whole blockchain essentially? Could it... right. One variation of the 
addressing schemes that you can come up with is a view only wallet that can identify outputs you own, but can't actually read the amounts in those outputs. So you could have something with like my Monero that's that finds all the outputs you own and gives them to you, but it doesn't know how much is how, the amount involved. Ah. Like right now, my Monero knows all the amounts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it'd be cool if they could find the outputs for you, which is convenient. But I yeah, can't read what's in them. Oh yeah, that's great. So that would get rid of some of that that criticism there. So you you would still have that that improved usability uh, without that sacrifice that you're making with them potentially. That's one, one possibility. Yeah, very. There, it's not like a infinite infinite capabilities of these variations, but like yeah, there's several options to choose from, and you'll get different capabilities with each option. And I think I heard you mention it potentially could make atomic swaps more usable. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> Monero? There's too much to remember. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you can now, with, with Surface, it's possible to chain transactions on top of each other without having a blockchain involved. So right now, if you want to make a transaction that spins from another transaction, this transaction has to be in the blockchain because when you say, hey, in this transaction, I'm spending the output that exists in the ledger, it has to be in the ledger. But with Seraphis, you can, you can authorize the spend of an output without saying where it is in the ledger because the, the membership proof uh, of the three things, remember, the membership proof and the proof that you're spending, that you're authorizing the spend of an output, these are separate. So you don't have to do the membership proof right away. You can just say, hey, I'm spending this output, even though the output isn't in the blockchain. So you can create a transaction that spends something in the blockchain. And then the outputs of that transaction, right, hold on. <laughs> Yeah, you could, from the outputs of that transaction, you can make another transaction, but don't submit it yet. And then you make a third transaction that spends the outputs from that transaction. And then, yeah, this is transaction training. You can just keep going up and up and up. And then I guess this allows atomic swaps to be more useful. I don't know why, but it does. <laughs> <laughs> and I think potentially for doing something like a, a Kickstarter on Monero, right? Which we've never been able to really do. Oh, uh, yeah. There's like, also Rockne collaborative Rockne funding, I call it, mm -hmm. where uh, you can, multiple people can contribute funds to a transaction before it's submitted. So, yeah, you can crowdsource all the funds for a transaction. Uh, you can do this because or it's easier to do this because I guess you could do it now anyway. You could do it in the current protocol if you change some some of the rules, but since that's not likely to happen in Surface, it would be easy to do, I guess. So it's kind of like a separate feature that could be added to Surface, but could you know, be doing that do. easier. Yeah, which is I think that'd be very you know that'd be a great thing to have, especially on you know the way we we fund things in Monero. It'd be cool to have more of a Kickstarter-like model where funds can get essentially kicked back if uh, funding amounts aren't reached. One one downside to that is the person getting funded could complete the transaction on their own. Like they could just stick their own money in if there's a big gap. Like okay. and then they just run away with the little amount left that that the people contributed. So it's not it's not when it's full of other people's contributions, it's when it's full of contributions. Right, right, right. Including your own contributions. Right. Well, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Um, how about, you know, there's a lot of talk now with exchanges potentially selling paper Monero, right? So we don't know that they actually have the Monero that they say they have, and maybe they're just, you know, people are buying Monero. And since they're keeping it on the exchange, the exchange 
doesn't necessarily even have to have that Monero on hand, right? It's not until people are pulling their Monero out that they'll have to come up with the actual Monero to, to send off. And this may be, you may allow exchanges to, uh, you know, uh, manipulate Monero or just make money off of the fa- off of selling something they don't even have. Uh, like fractional reserve. Fractional way. reserve Monero. So uh, I don't know if you saw that there's a lot of talk about that potentially, uh, you know, being something that's that's taking place, right? And we wouldn't be any of the wiser because we don't have any insight into what the exchanges are doing and there's no way for us to see uh, the holdings they have. Would... S- these these new view key schemes potentially allow uh, you know us to create a way for exchanges to more easily show us that they have the funds on hand that they claim to have. I think you could, but there might be a lot of privacy implications because if you give your view keys out to someone, now they can see. And then these these keys can show how much amounts are trans the amount how the amounts in the outputs that you send and receive. Then you're gonna have a lot of information about the users of that service, how much money they're sending and receiving. Um, I think there's this right now there's this what's it called? Like a can't remember what it's called. There's this proof you can do, like proof of reserves or something. Mm-hmm. Reserve proof. Yes, I heard. I've heard that so about. Yeah. How much you like a a range about how much you own? Mm-hmm. Like you can do a range proof saying I we we have this much unlocked. But I think all these kinds of things have privacy implications because you have to reveal something to someone. Um, if it's not an auditor. Like a private auditor, then you can this can this information can just become public, and then I don't know if the users will be very happy about that. But maybe I yeah I don't I don't really know if there's a way to do that without compromising something. But I think it's isn't it common to have like auditors that say hey how are your books looking? You're supposed to yeah. Um... But you know, there, there's all these rumors that you know some some large exchanges may be getting away with uh, selling paper Monero. I don't, I don't know how. I, you know, it's all speculation. I I'd remember. say don't store your Monero on the exchange, just in case. One hundred percent. We we always tell everybody to do that, no matter what, whether or not these rumors are true. Uh, you should be pulling your Monero off the exchange. How about the the twenty minute? St- uh, send lock time that's currently in place. So you have to wait for 10 blocks to confirm if you receive a transaction or if you send, you can't send again for another 10 blocks. Yeah. Um, so the reason this exists is because, okay, your your transaction says you're spending an output among a set of outputs. And what happens if one of these outputs disappears? Now your transaction is invalid and it goes in the garbage. So if you're referencing outputs that are very recent, they could easily be reorged into oblivion. And then your transaction goes in the garbage bin. So this is a, an attack vector because someone could spam trans, spam transactions and also spam double spends of their own transactions. So reorgs are things that happen naturally. There's always these very small reorgs happening that are like only a block or one like one to five blocks long. Where different because because the, the network is asynchronous and communication is always breaking down or whatever. There's always these small reorgs happening where some blocks are thrown away and replaced with other blocks. So an attacker could take advantage of this to destroy other people's transactions um, by they add, they add transactions and then those the outputs in those transactions are referenced by new transactions by honest users 
and then a reorg happens and now the malicious person who is double spending himself causes some of those outputs to be thrown away and now the, the honest user transaction is invalid because the outputs that he referenced are gone so you could maliciously throw cause people honest users transactions to disappear and so to prevent this we have to wait 10 blocks before we can spend an output I don't think this is has any kind of solution. If Stack you're referencing, doesn't get us any any closer to a solution there. No, not well. There, there's a, there is one way. Um, you can kind of get around it if you're in if you're transacting with um, with like a friend or someone you trust, then you can defer or you can delegate creating a membership proof to the recipient of the transaction. So you can do this transaction chaining business where you make a transaction spending something that isn't spendable yet, either because it's not in the blockchain or because it's in the 10 block window. And then you send this unfinished transaction to the recipient and then they can wait 10 blocks and finish it and submit it. That's one way you can get around it with Seraphis. But I think from a broader point of view, I don't think it's really possible without reducing the privacy of transactions. So the only real solution would be to have a transaction type where you, you directly reference the output you're spending. So you don't have any reference set, you don't have any decoys. You just say, I'm spending this output. And then you don't have the attack vector that I talked about. But I don't know if that's really a realistic solution like from uh i don't know if anyone would really be happy to have that kind of privacy reduction added to the protocol so you're basically saying as long as we're using ring signatures we're not going to be able to get around this this problem as long as, as long as we're using proof of work we cannot get around this you can easily get around it with a a protocol that doesn't have reorgs but I don't think we're ever going to stop using proof of work. So yes, ring signatures and proof of work. These two mean you got 10 block lock time. Oh man. Oh, wow. We got to get rid of those. Come on. You, you, Unless someone has a brilliant idea. <laughs> that, that's where you come in. That, that, yeah, that, that, <laughs> and how about decoy selection? Because you know, there's a lot of talk about that, um, how we're constantly improving that. Um, Rucknium and Jay uh, Bierman are, are working on on improving that. Does Seraphis tie into that at all at improving our uh, the way uh, decoys yeah. are selected? Only indirectly by allowing larger ring sizes. Okay. So you got more rings to choose. Maybe uh, you can do more fancier selection schemes. That yeah, that's it. That's it really. Mm -hmm. It's kind of agnostic to how you select your ring members. Just hey, pick some, and then we'll prove, make a proof about it. Got it. So when do we expect Seraphis to be implemented? Well, I wouldn't like. Or it may not even be Seraphis, right? We're it's still not there. guaranteed to be implemented. Okay. There's no such thing as a uh, guarantee necessarily in Monero development. Um, First of all, something someone could discover that it's horribly flawed and then it goes in the garbage. That doesn't seem likely to me, but it's never impossible. Um, someone could today figure out that ring CT is horribly flawed and then of course we'd all be doomed, but that's the reality, I guess, of using these advanced techniques. Um, as more people look at it, uh, it becomes like, relatively less likely, I guess, that a flaw is present, but it never goes to zero. That being said, we also have to decide if it's acceptable to, I mean, like we as in people generically involved with development have to decide if it's acceptable to get rid of old address, like replace all the old addresses. So that will be a I think that would be a really big 
a community effort required to do that it would have a large impact on the ecosystem so is that worth it i don't know maybe maybe not and then there's a lot of implement there are a lot of implementation details that re will require a lot of engineering work from multiple people um so i wouldn't expect it before fall of next year probably we also have to get audits on any code that's written which takes time and money and effort and all that okay so that's that's not too bad and then we have the increased ring size which is right around the corner which will kind of hold us off until then right that's the idea people have yeah what when, when do we expect that to happen is there any sorry any... what oh the next hard fork yeah. uh like a tentatively this winter <laughs> okay. which is kind of a broad window <laughs> <laughs> depending on where you are in the world right <laughs> okay I'm not sure. We're, we're, there's no like set date anyone has. We're trying to get some last um, PRs like figured out. I guess. There's, there's I have a multi sig PR that's in in review right now. It's kind of a big fix up of some flaws in the implementation. So I think that needs to get merged before we can have a hard fork. At least I think so. But that might be a couple of weeks, so yeah, it's all up in the air, really. How do you, how do you feel about the the current mechanics of Monero right? Now? The the behind the scenes of Monero right now, the way that the devs are working together and implementing changes is it is it is it a nice smooth process? Are we seeing um are th are things you know uh, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's ever been a smooth pro process, but I think it. I don't think there's any like deeply concerning problems with Monero development. It's it's always been this kind of people contribute things and sort of works out in the end, <laughs> kind of mess. <laughs> but I think it would be concern. It would actually be concerning if development was more organized. And there were more uh, interest groups lobbying for things uh, because Monero is kind of an idea and it, it's not an organization or um, someone's project. It's, this, it's an idea that is supported by people, by people who contribute ideas and code but it's not something that's owned by those people in any either objective or like abstract sense. So I think it's good that the people who work on Monero aren't, don't view themselves as the, um, the, the Monero team or uh, Mr. Monero or anything like that. Yeah, I think it makes it more decentralized too, right? Yeah. That's what the that's the word that people use, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, there is a there is one code base, so I don't know how well decentralized like applies, but it's something along those lines. Yeah, it's people coming to consensus on on what that one code base should be. Right, without anyone having like the authority to make a decision about anything, which is kind of contradictory, but. It's about, the best we can do, I guess. How about, how about the brain power that's currently working on Monero? So obviously we we have you, we have ma many others, uh, but how do you feel about that current situation? I saw in Bitcoin there was uh, a recent announcement. One I forget the guy's name. One of the devs that a longtime dev recently left Bitcoin. Um, you know, we've we've had in Monero we've had people coming in and out. How do you currently feel about that? The amount of you know people that it's it's attracting that people just want to come because they're interested in the idea and they're coming to coming to work on it i think it's a i think it's a good it's not it doesn't feel like we're in a desert or anything like that i think people show up and have want to contribute and then make contributions and some people go for one reason or another um 
I wouldn't be, I'm not too concerned about it. Um, I guess I'd be more concerned with, with like the, the superstition that we always need to have people making progress on things. Like there's not necessarily infinite progress that can be made. Maybe there's a point where we just run out of things and ideas to implement. So it's always possible. <laughs> Like ideas, ideas aren't like uh, grown on trees. You don't just have a idea tree that spits out ideas all the time. <laughs> you mean we? You mean we get to the point where it Monero is good enough? It good enough. It's digital cash. It works as digital cash, and there's really not much more to do to it. Is that what you mean? I don't know if good enough is the word. It's more like a point where nobody knows what to do next. Right. Like it could be better maybe, but we don't know how to do that. So we're just going to stick with what we have because <laughs> we don't have any other choice. <laughs> hmm. That's, that's it's an... just like a possible future. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I think we're, we're far off from, from getting to that point though. It seems like, it seems like there's still plenty of uh, things to improve sure. on. Right. I think if, we were able to implement something like Halo 2 and get that stabilized. After that point, we might be in a kind of, a, we, we might be asymptotic in the number of things we can actually improve on. Mm -hmm. But we're not there, we're not there yet. We're still at least a year away from Seraphis. And then to get something like Halo 2 implemented and studied well, probably another year or two if Halo 2 is even worth pursuing or whatever, an alternative. So I think it is possible to reach an asymptote, but we're not there yet, no. So then how do you see like uh, Zcash versus Monero, right? Because we, we may, we're kind of heading towards the same point, right? We're trying to achieve the same goal, just taking different roads towards it. How do you, how do you view those different approaches? Like I feel like Monero's trying to be digital cash from day one, right? Like it's it's usable as digital cash today, um, whereas Zcash is trying to wait for things to be perfected before it actually can be digital cash. Is the sim simple way of looking at it as a way. I think there are a few perspectives to take into account. So, from one point of view. There are, there's no cryptocurrency that anyone, at least I would find interesting that could, well, they could probably handle all the interests that people have. So in terms of volume or in terms of um, pref like just individual preferences, like uh, in, in some sense, they're competing products that offer different features. Although that's not a very good word to use, it's kind of analogous to that. So you have people, I mean, you have people using Bitcoin that don't care about Monero and vice versa. So it doesn't necessarily matter if there are different cryptocurrencies because each currency can succeed in its own right. Like, it doesn't have to care what other projects are doing necessarily, unless those other project projects are so much better that your project doesn't have any users, which is true for a lot of projects. Um, most, most projects, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if that point was very clear, but the, another point is that. Um, like immutability is very important for a cryptocurrency. So it's this kind of expectation that people have that the currency that exists is not subject to any human um, ability to, to change, to change what exists. So you have the money that people own, 
no human can steal that money without the private keys or destroy that money without the private keys. Um, you have the supply of money, which uh, cannot be changed by anyone. Uh, this rule has been broken by several currencies. Um, and also the emission schedules is embedded in the supply. Um, and the, so these immutabilities, users have to expect that these are eternal, which has a big implication implication for how the how a project is developed and governed and who has the clout to change things and who has the who has the ethos to change things. So I think it's really important for if, if a project wants to last into the far future, it's really important to have um, yeah, my vocabulary today is not how I want it to be. <laughs> it's you important. To... You're 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 a master of Monero. I don't I don't think you you realize you're you're selling yourself short here. You could just we're all listening. So <laughs> it's important to have a an ethos, uh, like a community ethos that rejects all possibility of um violating that kind of contract that kind of imp implied contract about what is the currency it's this this thing that people own that can't be altered the, this like contract in code that can't be violated and also this the supply that cannot be affected and so i think bitcoin and monero are two of the strongest current cryptocurrencies on in that from that point of view. So Bitcoin, the idea of Bitcoin ever losing these immutabilities is kind of preposterous almost. Like you, you'd be laughed out of the room if you proposed making new Bitcoins with new rules or whatever, minting new Bitcoins or, or rolling back the chain to do some crap or whatever. Um, and Monero is very similar to that. Like there's a very deeply embedded expectation that no one is above is above the immutability of the code and the like this like, the idea of the currency as it exists. I think that's very important. So why why do I come bring this up with respect to Zcash? I think that there's a lot of doubt that people have maybe both implicitly and explicitly about how the Zcash currency is governed, I guess, like the, the, the people involved with it, there's a lot of skeptic skepticism about, are these people capable of breaking the immutab immutabilities implied in a cryptocurrency? I don't know if they are or not, but I think that's important to think about. Right, and that's something that they can never really change with technology, right? So it's 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 kind of like reputation, right? You only have, you have like one shot at having a good reputation. When you when you screw up, it's pretty hard to then uh, do something in the future that will erase that that mistake that gave you the bad reputation to begin with. And so, no matter how how much they invent invent on the technological side. They're not going to be able to easily overcome the reputation that they've already have. Is that a? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of look at it that way as well. But I think, I think it is cool that they're they're spending the resources that they have on trying to do better, like make better technology, because I mean, technology is a very real part of this whole puzzle, and so. Even if a lot of other things aren't going well for you, if you improve your technology, that's still a step in the right direction. And it it, it helps it helps you yourself, but it also helps improve the broader world by by adding a piece to the the mountain of human achievements. 
that slowly accumulate as new ideas are added. And that, that, that helps all of humanity, not just what you're working on. So I think that's good. Yeah, why do you, th why do you think they, uh, you know, are essentially, I mean, it's, it's open source Zcash, right? But they're not providing the, te the technology behind Halo to the public right away. Right. I don't know what they're doing with that. <laughs> I think there there's a little there's like a ethical conflict in Zcash between people who are very open source oriented and also people who are who really don't care about open source. Maybe I don't know if that, that might be that might be uh, speaking out of turn, but. I think I think when you get these kind of intellectual property nonsense, you have you ha you must have people involved who don't care about the ethos of open source, which is unfortunate. But um, the fact that their their licensing scheme is so like weak, I think that implies there are, are people involved who really do care and would be really not cool with a more restrictive licensing approach. That's my take, I guess. Yeah, I mean, once again, I think it plays to their, you know, their reputation, right? Because now everybody's looking at, at this and wondering, you know, why aren't you opening it up to the rest of the crypto community, right? Yeah, but I think it's, it is weak to the point where it is it will be available for use freely at some point like after a year or something right mm -hmm. uh, so i think they're just trying to get as much as they can without <laughs> really pissing people off right right but i don't know if it'll actually have any dividends it'll pay any dividends <laughs> for them yeah it seems like a bad play uh yeah. I, I was i read or i watched this video earlier about a World of Warcraft Reforged, three Reforged or something. It's this video game. And alongside this video game release, it was like a like supposed to be a refurbishment of an old game. And alongside this game, they introduced a new licensing scheme that that affected the old game that suddenly made it made all the custom games that people invented on their own, like the mods and so on. They made these property of the development company, Blizzard. And so this really upset a lot of people because all these things they invented on their own using the core game pieces or whatever are suddenly property of this company. And it's like, it's not clear that the company that did this actually gained anything because <laughs> they totally pissed off all their users, all these people who were really enthusiastic and like undermine their community and all this kind of thing. I don't know. I don't see like software IP as ever being very uh, non-toxic, I guess. Yeah, I think that's ultimately like, I think we, we said it in a couple of different ways, but that's ultimately the problem with Zcash is they have this corporation that's a part of them or behind them that's has these incentives, right? And it's it's affecting the decisions they make. And um, it's not just about creating the best form of digital cash in an, in an open and competitive way where anybody can come and participate and use the technology, but it's about uh, winning and potentially enriching those that are uh, a part of this corporation. Yeah, conflict of interest. Conflict how of they, interest. How they call it. How about Lightning Network on Monero or something like it, a second layer? Do you ever think about that? And is that tie into Seraphis at all, whether or not that would make Monero more amenable to a second layer? I haven't. I thought about it a little bit, but... Um... I, th I think that the ability to chain transactions is helpful to reach that kind of point, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, the, I think the problem is that 
it's not possible to like combine transactions, like squish them together. So I think with Lightning Network, my vague understanding is that you can make a lot of intermediate modifications to the channel state, and then it's easy to squash them together. Or if you publish the full, you can easily pu easily publish the full chain without anything bad happening. I don't really understand how it works, but it's difficult in Monero because I mean we have the twenty minute wait time between each transaction. So if you have this long chain transactions that you need to publish, it might take a few days <laughs> to publish the uh, the channel state. I don't know. It also might might become easier to uh, like cheat the channel and like double spend halfway through the chain. So you get like this, you find a favor favorable state in the in the channel, and then you publish publish that chunk of transactions and then you you immediately double you immediately spend off spend off of that into a new like you just spend the outputs that you own in that from that chunk of transactions. And then now the other part of the channel is invalid so maybe someone who actually understands how lightning next works and work works can uh, look at it deeper but i don't know do you think it's something that monero is going to eventually need to to continue to function as digital cash or we could we could get pretty know. far uh just running you know on the blockchain I think it would be cool to have uh, off-chain um, accounting, like like uh, guaranteed accounting almost, where you have like I think what will what will more practically happen is like a credit system, like what we have now with credit cards, where uh, you have some credit with a company and then you pay off the credit with Monero periodically. And then this credit is more easily usable. I think from our, like we have that with exchanges, basically. Mm -hmm. It's just this credit system where you can deposit and withdraw. It's more, well, it's similar to a credit system um, where you're, when you're spending things at an exchange, like you're making exchanges in the exchange, you're not actually trading on the blockchain you're just change, trading in the books of the exchange i think we'll see a lot more of this in the future but off-chain stuff where it's more guaranteed like with lightning network it would be cool but it's probably really hard because the technology the cryptography in monero is so um, advanced and um, has very strict requirements about what you can and cannot do Or maybe potentially atomic swapping from Monero into Lightning Network. Is that something Is that, that something we can do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's someone who knows about yeah, these things. Talk about it. What What are the other things you think about? What are What are some of the things that uh, kind of keep you up at night with regards to Monero that you're, you know, trying to solve or improve upon? Well, I think the other big topic that has my attention is multi-sig. Um, I wrote a lot about this in Zero to Monero too, about how you can have user-friendly multi-sig. Because right now it's pretty unfriendly. You have to use like the CLI or the MMS um, and these things aren't user-friendly, super, super user-friendly. Like there's no streamlined app or whatever for doing multi-sig stuff. And so I put a lot of thought into how you can have efficient multi-sig. But all that stuff's mostly like worked out already. I've already figured that stuff out. So these days I've just been work, working on Seraphis, trying to get it implemented. Um, I guess I put a lot of thought into how to, like from the software perspective, how to design the, how to write a protocol into code in a way that's easy to read, I guess, because a lot of the current 
code base is difficult to read. So I've been thinking a lot about how I could, is it possible to do, do something that's more readable? Easier, easier to extend with multiple hard forks. So if we have, we look in 20 years and we have 10 or 20 hard forks in the, those years, how will the code, code base look in 20 years? Will it be palatable? Right, and we want to keep it or make it as easy to understand as possible, right? So we could have more contributions being made right. to the program. It's also a lot easier to identify if it works how you expect if you can read it easily. So that I think a lot, if the current code base was easier to read, then we'd have a lot more people reading it and making sure that it does what it's supposed to do. So I think that's important. Didn't somebody submit a CCS that they were going to like go through the entire code base and try to make it easier to, to understand and that like is, I don't know, maybe <laughs> there's some resistance to changing the existing code. And I think I, I do understand that. So it's, it is risky to make big changes to code that we know, or we're pretty confident it works. So it's a lot easier to kind of sidestep the existing code and write new code for new things and let the new code be how you want it to be in terms of readability instead of risking um, breaking something by making large changes to the existing code which has been reviewed by multiple people even if not as many people as we'd like makes sense so sorry go ahead no 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 that's that's good i mean I, i'm uh I'm ready to wrap it up. I feel like I, I, I drained your brain enough for the day. Okay, sure. Where can people, you know, learn, follow you, learn more about what you're working on? What's the, what's the easiest way to keep up with uh, everything you're working on? Well, you can follow, look at my GitHub, UcoHB, my GitHub. Uh, that's where all my activity is. Uh, also, the Monero Research Lab IRC channel. channel where all my updates go so those are the main things awesome man R really great greatly appreciate you coming on and doing the show sure and look forward to seeing progress on Seraphis. okay and maybe a, a a new zero to monero at some point when uh when you have the time we'll see i'm trying to i'm, I'm trying to like not have as many things to do with cryptocurrency <laughs> i'm trying to find a point where i'm done with cryptocurrency oh, okay i keep having more things that i have to do well so, what is it that you want to potentially move on to ah those are secrets no those are secrets. <laughs> oh, if cool. i if i complete them then i'll tell you oh wow okay no no now i'm really interested okay it, this is the the mechanical engineering world or no it's, these are personal projects i have planned okay but now I have to do Seraphis, so here I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love that you're doing it. Uh, you're certainly having a, a tremendous impact on the Monero ecosystem and, and I'd say the world in general. So kudos, kudos to you. Well, thank you. All right, Kel, thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guest, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.